All right, guys, you ready? Let's go ahead and let's set. Uh, let's work with the Lord. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the Savior shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Well, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, that you gave those who went to OCC and yes. Lord we just pray that you would continue to provide and bless those boxes and that you would continue to bless those who served and Lord we just ask for today's service to be a blessing that you would give Pastor Doug the words to say and that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear what you have to say to us through your Holy Spirit in your name we pray Amen, Amen. 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 Amen.
prophecy father we pray that you would just open our hearts and our minds and our ears and eyes and all that we are father to the deeper truths that you would have for us today father um, use this message and messenger as you see fit do in every heart that which only you can do through the power of the holy spirit we love you and we praise you thank you for this time in jesus name and everybody said amen, amen. amen. today i want us to look at uh the promise of a savior um I don't know why I listed, I, I, when I sent out the text, I, I put the title of the message as The Promise of Christmas. Uh, I don't know why I put that, uh, other than I just was thinking of Christmas. And, and uh, But it, it really, when you think about it, the promise of a Savior is the promise of Christmas. I mean, either way, amen, I mean, it really is. So, so we're going to take a look at the promise of a Savior, though. We're going to be in two passages, the prophecy, which is Isaiah 7, 14, and then I want us to look at the fulfillment of the prophecy, which is Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. So you can follow along on your outline or on, on the screen up here, but take a look at God's word at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Here's what it says. It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, let's read that out loud together. Ready? Here we go. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now look at the fulfillment of that, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise, that when his, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, speaking of prof the, the prophecy of Isaiah, speaking of the prophet, saying, and here's the prophecy of Isaiah 7, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Which being interpreted is what? God, God with, with us. us. And now may God add his blessings to the reading and preaching of his word. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Some time ago, in fact, really, it's been over 100 years now, well over 100 years ago, a song was written that asked a question that's been asked over and over and over again. The song simply said, What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet and shepherds watch are keeping? Um, in the course of that song, the songwriter then answers the question by saying, This, this is. 
Christ the Lord. So he answers the question, asks the question, and answers it. This, this is Christ the Lord. Now, the question about Jesus and about who he is and the question about why he came has been asked for centuries now, hundreds of years, and, and yet it's been answered. In fact, hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, it was answered. Uh, it was answered in the book of Isaiah. For the book of Isaiah addresses the question of Jesus Christ. And though the book of Isaiah was written 750 years before Jesus was ever born, it helps us to understand the ministry of Jesus, and it helps us to understand the message of Jesus Christ. In fact, Isaiah is generally recorded as one of the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. And, and when you read the book of Isaiah, and when you ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate your heart and your mind as you read, it becomes very clear that Isaiah is really a prophet of redemption. He's a prophet of redemption. In fact, here's the first key thought on your outline there. Isaiah is the prophet of redemption. The theme of Isaiah's message is the redemption of God's people. Really, that's the theme of his whole book, is the redemption of God's people. And, uh, and so it's God's plan to redeem his people then, as we discover in the book of Isaiah, through his Savior. That's God's plan. So 750 years before Jesus came on the scene, God was already spelling it out for people. And so the book of Isaiah is filled then with references to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Isaiah 7.14 is all about. Look at the verse again. It's the next verse on your outline there. Isaiah 7.14, one more time. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and, and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now I want you to notice this morning that 750 years before Jesus was born, God through the prophet Isaiah promised a Savior. He promised us a Savior. And God keeps his promises. Amen? Amen? He promised the Savior. He gives us the promise of the Savior. And here's point number one on your outline. I want you to see that this promise is a miraculous promise. It really is. It is a miraculous promise. Just write that in there. It's a miraculous promise. It's miraculous in its nature. It is a miraculous promise. The Bible tells us concerning the coming of Jesus Christ that his entry into the world would be no ordinary entry. Uh, but it would be, in fact, a most miraculous event. So what's so miraculous about it? Well, here's letter A on your outline there. It is miraculous in its precision. It's miraculous in its precision. Every time I study the story of Christmas, and every time I study the coming of Jesus Christ to this earth, I am continually amazed at the tremendous precision with which his coming was predicted. <clears throat> I mean, tremendous precision. For example... And I had this on your outline there. The Bible tell, tells us how Jesus would come. Just write that in there. It tells us how Jesus would come. The Bible tells us in this passage that a virgin shall conceive a young woman who had never known a man intimately, a young woman who was innocent and chaste and prepared for marriage, would suddenly become pregnant without any human donor. Now, this is something that, humanly speaking, is impossible, and yet with God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we know how Jesus would come. A virgin would conceive. Secondly, the Bible also tells us when Jesus would come. It tells us how and tells us when. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, we have another prophecy concerning the coming of Christ. In that verse, the word weak, we discover in that, in that uh, passage, the word weak means a set of sevens. And so we know from that particular verse that Daniel was prophesying that 490 years from the reign of the Persian king by the name of Cyrus that Jesus Christ would come 490 years from that time. And when you study the chronology and the calendars, you're going to find that Jesus Christ was born exactly 490 years from Daniel's prophecy. I mean, just the precision of it, 490 years exactly. See, the, the prophets, under the leadership and influence of the Holy Spirit, were predicting the coming of the Messiah. So the Bible tells us how he will come, the Bible tells us when he will come, but thirdly, the Bible also tells us where Jesus would arrive, where he would arrive. The Bible tells us where Jesus would be born. Look at the next verse, Micah 5, 2, where Jesus would arrive. 5, 2, Micah 5, 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So he's coming forth to be ruler of Israel, and his goings forth have been from old and from everlasting. Um, God says, Bethlehem, from you, Though you're just a small little city compared to most cities, from you, there's going to come forth to me the ruler of Israel. And so the prophet Micah tells us where Jesus would arrive, in Bethlehem. And then number four, Isaiah tells us time and time again, actually, why Jesus would come. He tells us why. 
Let's write that in there. He tells us why Jesus would come. The, the Old Testament predicted not only how and when and where, but also why Jesus would come. Look at Isaiah, how Isaiah puts it in Isaiah 53, 5. He says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. In other words, Jesus was coming because of our sin, our transgressions. This is why he was coming, because our sin had separated us from God. Jesus had to come. And it says, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. This is why Jesus came to pay the price for our sins, so that we could find peace with God again. We could be restored in our relationship to God. Look at, look at how Isaiah put it in the next verse, Isaiah 50, verse 6. It says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. What an incredible prophecy that is. I mean, because as you study about the crucifixion of Jesus, you're going to find that, that that's exactly what happened to him. I mean, it's just as if, Isaiah is speaking as if God is speaking, as if Jesus is speaking from the very cross of Calvary at that moment, 750 years before it actually happened. I mean, that's, that's amazing. 750 years before Jesus came, the Bible's prophets told us exactly how Jesus would come, when he would come, where he would be born, and he told us why he would come. And the reason he came to this earth was that he might shed his blood on Calvary's tree so that our sins would be paid for so that we might be able to receive the gift of salvation that was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we see that this miraculous promise was miraculous in its precision. But here's letter B. It was also miraculous in its place. It's also miraculous in its place. The significance of Jesus being born in Bethlehem really, I, I don't think, can be overstated. The Bible says that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. In the fullness of time. That, in other words, when the time was just right. God came to earth in the form of man at the right time. And as that time came, the Bible says that the political climate of the world began to shift. It was beginning to shift. And that's interesting because it seems that when you study the Bible and you study the major events of Scripture, you'll find that it seems like that the, the political climate of the world always seems to be shifting and changing just prior to God doing something very significant. I think that's one of the reasons we need to pay attention today, because the political climate of our world, even of our own country, is changing drastically, and it's changing quickly. And, and I think that ought to give us a clue. It ought to give us some indication that Jesus is about to do something, and God's about to do something very dramatic. So as the political climate of the known world at that time began to shift, God saw fit to send Mary and Joseph into a place called Bethlehem. Now, we realize that with God, there are no accidents. We realize that with God, that even political structures, the political climate is not an accident. Amen. God allows things to exist for a reason. Because the Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. It doesn't matter who the king is. The, heart, the heart's still there with the Lord. I mean, think about that. I mean, the only reason that... They're still alive is because God allows it. Amen? Amen. I mean, that's, that's the only reason any of us is alive, is because God allows it. And so when Caesar made his decree that a, a census should be taken, and when Mary and Joseph found themselves in Bethlehem to register for the census, it was no accident, uh, because they were of the house and lineage of David, and, the, and, and Bethlehem was the city of David. And that's important because the prophets of the Old Testament had said that this Messiah who would come would one day sit on David's throne. Uh, in fact, look at this next verse, Luke 1.32, which is an echo of the prophecy of 2 Samuel 7.13. It says this, it says, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So what's he going to give unto him? The throne of who? His father David. And so Bethlehem, the very hometown of David, becomes very significant in regards to the place where Jesus would be born. And... Uh, and I think you, you, you'll find that, that, uh, that certainly Jesus is of the lineage of David's house. Um, so though Jesus was not received as king in his first coming, and while the Bible says that Jesus was despised and rejected of men at his first coming, I, I want to remind you this morning that the prophecy of Luke 132, that prophecy we just read, is going to be fulfilled really at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. That prophecy is going to be fulfilled that Jesus will indeed rule forever upon the throne of David. So when we think about the precision of this amazing promise of Scripture, we realize that every detail of the promise of a Savior was recorded hundreds of years before it ever happened. That's amazing. So when it comes to the miraculous promise of Scripture, we see that it's miraculous in its precision, miraculous in its place, and here's the letter C, it is miraculous in its person. It's miraculous in its person. 
And when I say it's person, I mean the person of the Holy Spirit of God. In the person of the Holy Spirit. I mean, look at this next verse, Luke 1, 34 through 35. It says, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost, who? The Holy, the Holy, Ghost. Ghost. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Would you circle the phrase where it says, seeing I know not a man? That little phrase, seeing I know not a man. You see, the scriptures are, are replete with references to the fact that Mary never knew a man. There's plenty of references to that. And that Mary was absolutely a virgin. And the Bible protects that truth because were it not for that truth, then the Holy Spirit's conception would really become null and void. And and then the deity of Christ would become null and void. And then the death of Jesus on the cross would be no more significant than anybody else's death on the cross. Amen. I mean, Jesus had to be born of a virgin. Amen? Amen? He had to be born that way. So this verse makes it very clear that the child in Mary's womb was conceived not by man, but by the Holy Spirit. See, this promise is miraculous in its person because the person who fulfilled the promise is the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? He's the one that fulfilled it. So the third person of the, of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is responsible for this occurring. So when we consider the, the scriptural promise of a Savior, we have to realize that it, it is a most miraculous promise. But not only that, I also want you to see, secondly, that it is a manifested promise. It's not only a miraculous promise, it's a manifested promise. Now, all of us have seen or experienced promises that have never seen the man uh, they, they, they never seem to manifest themselves we've seen promises that never get manifested for example there are those who try have tried to predict the date for the second coming of jesus christ and certainly no one can predict that because jesus said no one will know the day or the hour of the lord's return amen, amen. no one's going to know the day but yet some have falsely predicted the day of christ's return and you know what it never manifested itself. It never made itself known. Manifest means to make it known, manifest, to be revealed. And then there are the lesser important things, such as weather predictions. Yeah. I mean, you know, weather predictions. I, we, we, you know, some, we tend to trust our weathermen, you know, uh, and, and they're right a lot of the time, but then there are other times when they're exactly wrong, right? Uh, they can say sunshine all day, and you see it on their thing, uh, sunshine all day, and then they all of a sudden it's raining, you know, I mean, they, they, they can be wrong. I mean, uh, have you noticed that many, if not most, of the earthly predictions that are made tend to fail? Mm -hmm. And, and they, they never seem to manifest themselves in the way that, they, that people predict. Uh, for example, last night on the way home, uh, we kept hearing on the Google thing, on the map thing, whatever it was, that we would get into the traffic and it would go, there's an eight-minute delay. 20 minutes later, we're still there, and it's going, another eight minutes. It'll be another eight. So <laughs> their prediction was not correct, right? I mean, no matter how they try to predict it, you can't predict, you know, uh, buckets flying across the freeway <laughs> hitting your car. You just can't predict that stuff. So uh, they, they have a tr problem manifesting themselves. That's true in sports. It's true in weather, true in politics, many other areas of life. We make all these predictions, but, you know, they don't always manifest themselves. And the great thing about the promise of the Savior is that this promise was manifested to mankind. It was made to the entire world. I mean, several things can be seen in this. For example, let's start with this. Here's letter A. It was manifested, first of all, to Mary. It was made known to Mary. Look, look at Luke uh, 1, 30 and 31 on your outline there. Here's the manifestation of the promise of a Savior to, to Mary. It says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. The promise of a Savior that was made by Isaiah 750 years before this was now being made personally known to Mary. It became very personal to her. And I believe it's important to understand that before Mary would ever have this promise fulfilled in her life, before Mary could ever give birth to the Christ, before she would ever conceive of Christ in her womb, the truth is she first of all had to conceive of Christ in her heart. Amen. That, that promise had to be here. It had to be in her heart. She had to believe the promise of the angel, and she had to trust God's word regarding this miraculous promise. 
And it was after she had fully accepted God's word into her heart that she was able to be used of God to bring forth the Messiah. So it was, first of all, manifested to Mary. But secondly, let her be. It was also manifested then to Joseph. First to Mary, then to Joseph, manifested to Joseph, made known to Joseph. Look at the next verse, Matthew 1.20. It says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, all of us can certainly have some empathy for Joseph and for what he had to deal with there. Um, we can, I mean, here he was, a virgin himself. And he was engaged to this young woman, whom he believed to also be a virgin. And here they were preparing for marriage, and they were planning for their future, and they had remained chaste, and they had remained pure for each other. And, but now, out of the blue, Joseph gets word that his fiancée is now pregnant, and he knows it's not his baby. And, and so Joseph is stunned by the news, and all of Joseph's friends are telling him to dump her, to get rid of her, to, you know, to stone her, actually. And yet God calms his fears, because God manifests his promise personally to Joseph. The angel said, Joseph, fear not to take Mary to be thy wife. Now, look, when it comes to the Christmas story, Joseph may be one of the most misunderstood characters or possibly one of the most overlooked characters in the story itself. For example, there was a little eight-year-old boy who was showing a picture he had drawn of the nativity scene, and, and he was showing it to his little six-year-old sister, and he had drawn it himself, and he was pointing out the characters in the story that he had drawn, and, and he said, well, here's baby Jesus, I drew Jesus, and here's the shepherds, and here's the wise men, and here's a cow, and, and here's Mary, and, and the six-year-old sister said, well, where's Joseph? And the eight-year-old brother thought about it for a moment, and then he said, well, he's the one taking the picture. <laughs> and I guess you could say that's, that's thinking on your feet, you know, but... But a lot of the time, Joseph seems to be left out of the picture, doesn't he? We just, we just don't think a lot about Joseph. And, but the truth is, Joseph was anything but left out. Because God manifested his promise to Joseph personally, just like he did to Mary. He did it to Joseph. Joseph had a personal encounter with God. And once again, before Joseph could ever be used by God to be the stepfather to God, he had to have God's word firmly tucked away in his heart as well. And listen, the truth is... It doesn't matter whether you're really noticed a lot by other people or not. It, I mean, the truth is, it really doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're popular. It doesn't matter whether you're good-looking or famous. It really, I mean, the fact is, God has taken notice of you. God has noticed you. And, and God is most certainly manifesting himself personally to you and I this morning through this message, through his word. Amen? Yeah. He's manifesting himself to each of us. God's taken special note of you. Maybe, maybe, maybe you know your spouse doesn't always acknowledge you like they should. Maybe, maybe your children don't acknowledge you. Maybe the people you work with uh, never acknowledge all that you do for for them and for the company. Or maybe even your brothers and sisters in Christ have failed to acknowledge you like they should. But listen to me, God, God, God has taken special note of you. God's taken special note of you. That's why you're here. God wanted you to hear this today. He He wants you to know that. He sees you, and He knows you, and that God has chosen you. And even now, He's personally manifesting Himself to you through His Word and through this message and through the power of the Holy Spirit. God manifested Himself to Mary. God manifested Himself to Joseph. God is manifesting Himself to you and I. But that's not all. Here's letter C. God has also manifested His promise to the whole world. It's gone out to the whole world. It's manifested. It's made known to the whole world. The promise of a Savior has literally been manifested to the world. It contains and, and it continues to be manifested to the world. The Bi I tell you, the Bible is the most and continues to be the most and the best selling book of all time. It, it, it is and, and all over the world. And there is no message that has been delivered and proclaimed and preached as much as the message of Jesus Christ. No message talked about or preached as much as that of Jesus Christ. And this message has been preached to the Jews and to the Gentiles around the world for 2,000 years now. For 2,000 years, the gospel has been going around the world. God has been manifesting himself to the known world. Look, look at Luke 2.10. And by the way, that's, that's one of the things that I, I love about OCC is because these boxes, the manifestation of God and his word is going to children all over the world, all over the place. And that's, that's exciting to me because I know that, that those little boxes that we were wrapping, those little boxes that we were sealing up and sending off, that there's going to be a kid who opens that box up. And somebody's going to be there when they open that box up to tell them about Jesus Christ and to tell them about God's love for them. And that little kid is going to be given the opportunity to come to know Christ. 
Look at Luke 2.10. It says, And the angel said unto them, this is the angel speaking to the shepherds here, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to who? All to people. all people. How many people? All, all people. So this message, this promise of a Savior is not just for a select few. It's not just for a particular denomination, or it's not just for a particular nationality of people. But this message, this promise of a Savior, is good news for everybody, everywhere, and for all time. What an incredible manifestation of a promise of a Savior. And I guess a passage of Scripture that sort of encapsulates what this is really all about would be 1 Timothy 3.16. It's the next verse on your outline there. But I think about what Paul says in regards to the manifestation of this, this Savior to the world in this verse. He says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God is revealed, made known. In the flesh now. That's the mystery of God is. Before we go on, would you circle that phrase, God was manifest in the flesh? You know, one of the primary things that separates Christianity from false religions and from cults in the world is the fact that we believe that without question, Jesus Christ was God being manifest in the flesh. Amen. We believe that. The Bible declares that. We believe that Jesus Christ was the God-man. I was thinking on the way home yes, uh, uh, Friday when we were coming back, I was, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, were it not for Christmas, were it not for the Christian's celebration of Christmas, there would be nothing else, no other religion in the world that would have reason to celebrate this time of year for anything. I mean, when you think about it, we, we have to step aside, we, you know, people and uh, some, some workers in stores are trained to say, don't say Merry Christmas, Say what? Happy holidays, right? Because everybody has to be treated, everybody has their own version of Christmas. No, they don't. No, they don't. They're just trying to substitute Christmas with something else, amen? They, they would have no reason to do that if it weren't for Christmas to begin with, amen? So I, I don't think Christians, I don't think we should be apologetic about Christmas at all, amen? I mean, it, it, it is ours. It belongs to those who believe in Christ. Amen? And, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. One of the primary things that separates us from everybody else is the fact that God, uh, that Jesus Christ is God. We believe that Jesus Christ was the God-man. He was not a little God becoming a bigger God. He was not a prophet who would never be God. Uh, but Jesus was God before the world ever began. And he is and always will be God. He is the second person of the Trinity. Amen? Amen? Jesus is God. So Paul says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Now thank God that the Bible says that the Lord is not slacking concerning his promises. Amen? I mean, in other words, when God makes a promise, you can take it to the bank. He's going to fulfill it. When God gives us a promise that his son is coming to earth, that the Messiah is coming, when God promises 750 years before it happens that he's sending a Savior, you can count on it. God's going to keep his promises. 750 years. It's been 2,000 years since we received the promise of Christ's second return. Do you think he's coming back? Yes. Of course he is. Because God always fulfills his promises. Amen. Thank God that Jesus did come. See, we see that in Isaiah 7:14. We find a miraculous promise. It was miraculous in its precision and in its place, and in its person. But we also see that it was manif a manifested promise. It was manifested to Mary, and to Joseph, and to you and I, and indeed to the whole world. But that's not all. Not only was it a miraculous promise, a manifested promise, but here's number three. It was also a meaningful promise. Just write that in there. It was a meaningful promise. A lot of people tend to look at the Bible as some kind of an archaic, irrelevant document. They even look at, Chris at the Christmas story like, they were hearing about Santa Claus or something, that it's just a fabricated tale of some kind or something. They fail to recognize that there's no more applicable and there is no more relevant truth than the truth of God's Word in regards to the coming of Jesus Christ. And we don't need to try and bring it down to people's level. We don't need to do that, as some people put it. We don't need to try to do that because God has already brought it down to all of our levels by coming to this earth to begin with. And when some pastors or TV evangelists talk about how they have to get the gospel down to the average man's level, um, that's almost, I think, an insult to an almighty God. That's why I think some of these commercials now that we see on television where they have you know, gangbangers and stuff like that, and they go, see, Jesus is just like them. 
you know, and stuff, and I'm or whatever it is. Those, you know, I I, I watch those commercials and I go, I, I I think that's insane. They're just trying to bring God down to this guttery level where you know I go, no, you don't have to bring God down. You don't have to do that. The message is plain in and of itself. Amen. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is. Jesus, born of a, in a manger to a simple carpenter and a young girl, had been seen by shepherds and innkeepers and wise men alike. I mean, how much more down to earth does God need to make it before some people will understand it? See, the problem isn't understanding. That's not the problem. People understand it just fine. It's not. A, it's not about. It's not understanding. It's just a refusal to trust and believe. That's the problem. Because this is the most meaningful and direct message that the world has ever received. And people can understand it, and they do understand it. They just don't want to receive it and believe it. In fact, I want you to see just how meaningful this message is. Look at the next verse. Look at Matthew 1, 23. It says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Amen. Would you circle the word interpreted right there? Which be, I think that's an interesting word. Interpreted, he said, which being interpreted is. In other words, God says, I want you to know what this means. That's what he's saying. God says, I'm going to bring forth my son, I'm going to bring forth a Savior, and he's going to be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is, in other words, God says, I want to be very clear on this, I want you to know and understand who he is, I want you to understand why he's coming, which being interpreted is. And, and so we see here in the Gospels that the name Emmanuel is a name that God wants us to understand and to comprehend. So here's letter A on your outline there. We see that this promise is meaningful in its interpretation. It is meaningful in its interpretation. And here's Matthew 1, 23 again. It says, which being interpreted is. Say that with me out loud. Let's say it together. Which being, being interpreted, interpreted is. is. Now, perhaps some of you have traveled and been to international airports before and where they had the name of a particular destination in many different languages. And uh, you'll see that, that they have the, and it comes up in it's different languages and stuff. Why is that? Why is it in different languages? Well, it's because people from different countries around the world are going to pass through that airport, and so they're interpreting that location so that people will understand it. Uh, the airport wants people to know how to get to the right gate, to the right place, and to the right plane in order to get to the right destination. So it takes some interpretation to accomplish that fact. It has to be interpreted. And God wants you and I to fully understand what's going on here. So when he says that his name is Emmanuel, the Holy Spirit says, let me just make this clear. Let me interpret this for you, just in case you don't know what Emmanuel, the name Emmanuel means. What does it mean? It means God with us. Amen. How much plainer can God be? Amen? God with us. That's what it means. You know, sometimes it amazes me as to how many cults and religions actually get started when God really made it so simple for us to understand. I mean, God says, I want to make this simple, and I want you to understand who Jesus is. He is God with us. That's who Jesus is, God with us. That's not complicated. Amen? Amen. I mean, it's not complicated. I mean, God's Word doesn't make it complicated, and it doesn't even make it hard to understand. Not really. But we can make it that way. That's the problem. We tend to make it that way. Several years ago, my family and I had a chance to go to Disney World in Florida. We, the kids were small, and we went to Disney World, and Doug and Alicia were just little yes. kids at that point. We, Nine and seven. Yeah, we went to Disney World, and uh, this was before Disney went woke. And, uh, and we went to Disney World there, and we were going through the World Showcase at Epcot Center there. And the World Showcase was a pretty interesting place because they had all these different countries highlighted from around the world. And, and in each of the countries that were highlighted, they had rides in there that you could ride and uh, all of these countries all of the rides were being operated by exchange students from that country mm -hmm. so they would bring in exchange students from the country to work through the summer and through the different seasons and stuff like that so while the kids were going to school they would work at disney and things like that and they would they would uh, but but they didn't speak very good english <laughs> the people working those rides didn't speak very good english well we're standing in line to ride a ride in germany we get on the ride and, uh, and all of a sudden the ride breaks down and w w th then there's this loudspeaker that comes on and, and a guy on a loudspeaker to give us some information because the ride had stopped with us on it. And so we were listening for this information and when he spoke, this is what we heard. He said, ladies and gentlemen, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I repeat, blah, 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 blah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I repeat, blah, 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 blah. And no matter how many times he would repeat, nobody understood what he was saying, all right? <laughs> nobody understood a word he was saying. He was from Germany. Nobody, nobody spoke German, and so he was speaking German. Nobody understood it. Or his English was so broken up by German that, that we just couldn't understand it. The point is, human beings can certainly mess things up in their efforts to interpret things. Amen? Yeah. We can get it all messed up. Mm -hmm. But God never does. Right. God doesn't get it messed up. God's word is very clear. God says his name is Emmanuel, and, and I want to interpret that for you. And God doesn't say... Blah, 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 blah. I repeat, blah, blah, blah. God doesn't say that. God says, here's what it means. Emmanuel means God with us. Amen. He's with us. Folks, I'm so glad that God makes it so that even I can understand the gospel. God says Jesus is God with us. Amen. His very name declares it. Look at, look at what Isaiah 43, 11 says. I, this is what Isaiah 43, 11, this is Isaiah. Remember, 750 years before the coming of Christ, he says, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Amen. You know what that's saying? When the Savior comes, guess who it's going to be? Me. That's what God's saying. When the Savior comes, it's going to be me. The Bible is very clear. There's no Savior but Jehovah God. And in Christ, God's plan of himself coming to this earth to be that Savior, yet preserving his holy character was absolutely fulfilled. And see, this is meaningful in its interpretation that you and I, listen, that we can grab a hold of it today, that Jesus Christ, God's Son, loved us, and He died on the cross for our sins, and that, that He came to manifest God to us, and He came to be God before us. And so Jesus Christ is our only way of redemption because only Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. Nobody else fits that bill. That's right. So we see that this promise is meaningful in its interpretation, but that's not all. Let it be. This promise is not only meaningful in its interpretation, but it's meaningful in its invitation. It's meaningful in its invitation. When we think about the term of Emmanuel, God with us, we're reminded of the fact that Jesus Christ, after he was born in a manger, the Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and in favor with man. I mean, that's how God, that's how Jesus grew. The Bible says that Jesus was a perfect man. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. The Bible says that Jesus suffered pain and agony and loss in life and even wept when he had pain. He wept it as a result of emotional pain. The Bible says that Jesus knew what it was to have friends turn on him. Jesus knew what it was to have people reject him. He knew what it was to ultimately suffer the agony and pain of the cross of Calvary. Sometimes as Christians, our attitudes, I think, are not always what they should be. Because sometimes we become convinced that nobody knows or understands our trials or our difficulties but us. Amen. Nobody knows what we're going through but us. And... And, and certainly I don't want to, and I want to say this to you, but I, and I don't want to minimize what we go through because I know it's painful, I know it's difficult, and, and it's true that sometimes there's nobody else on earth around us physically that knows what we're going through, but that doesn't mean that somebody doesn't know. Amen. I mean, God knows. You know, while our spouse may not understand us full, fully and what we're going through, and though our friends may not know what we're going through, there's always one who understands, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? He always knows. And there's no reason to ever feel completely alone if you're a Christ follower, because Jesus absolutely always completely understands what you're experiencing. He always does. Cindy and I were thinking about that last night. We were driving back from, from uh, we went to the H-E-B there in, in uh, Cibolo, and we were on our way back home, and, um, and I was thinking about you know, how, how amazing these times that we live in. I mean, you know, the technology of today is just so amazing. I, I mean, when you think about the fact that you can plug in a map and, and you can Google, I mean, there is a satellite that's circling our planet that knows exactly where we're at, that can identify and pinpoint where we're at from way up in outer space. And there's a signal that bounces off of some place here in the world that hits the satellite, bounces back, and then goes back over and in, in just a fraction of a second of a time, I mean, can identify where we're at. Isn't that amazing? And yet we don't think God can do that? Mm -hmm. We don't think that God doesn't know where we're at individually and what we're feeling, what we're going through individually? If we can do that with technology and God gave us the ability to create that, Certainly he can do. Amen? Amen? Certainly he can do. He knows what we go through. There's no reason for us to ever really feel alone. God is with us always. 
It's not on your outline there, but Hebrews chapter 4 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points rather tempted like as we are yet without sin. Amen. In other words, every trial, every difficulty, every difficult feeling you have, Jesus has been there. He, he identifies. He knows. You feel discriminated against? Jesus has been there. You feel like no one cares? You feel physical pain? You feel abused? You feel neglected? Whatever it is you feel... I want to encourage you to take your eyes off of yourself and put your eyes to the cross and see Jesus for a moment and recognize that Jesus has indeed felt all of those things. He's felt it all. That's why Emmanuel, God with us, is so meaningful in its interpretation, but it's even more meaningful in its invitation. Because God with us says this in John 3, 16, look at it, for God so loved the world. In fact, let's read this together. Ready? Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wow. The promise of a Savior is extended to each of us today, and the promise of Christ is this, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Folks, that's the most meaningful invitation that anyone will ever receive. We may not be invited to the big Christmas party this year, wherever that may be. We may not be invited to our relatives' Christmas gatherings, wherever that may be. Um, and yet we're invited to God's gathering. Amen. I mean, Jesus says, I'm inviting you. I want you to know I want you to be a part of my family. Be a part of my family. I want you to receive me as your Savior because I want to give you a home for all eternity. And God has done that for each of us. Amen. He's given us a family and a home for all eternity. The truth is, Jesus doesn't just like you and I. He doesn't just like us. He's crazy about us. He's crazy in love with us. He loves you with a love that we can't even put into words. The King of Kings, that pre-eternal existent Son of God, would leave the streets of gold and would leave heaven's glory and would choose to be born in a manger and would choose to live on this world for 33 years just so he could say to each and every one of us, I love you. I love you. That, my friends, is a meaningful interpretation and it's a meaningful invitation from God himself. God's inviting you and I to receive his free gift of salvation. Look at Romans 6, 23. Look at this. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, that's the Christmas gift of God. That's what Bethlehem's all about. Amen? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. And folks, eternal life is not to be found in any church membership. It's not to be found in a particular denomination. It's not going to be found in the Catholic Church. It's not going to be found in a mosque. It's not going to be found in good works done for the Lord Jesus Christ, even though that's a good motive for doing it for Jesus Christ. It's not going to be found there. But eternal life is only going to be found in a person. The one who is God with us. Amen? Amen? In that personal relationship. The promise of a Savior is a miraculous promise, and it's a manifested promise delivered to you and I today. But it's also a meaningful promise, and it's invitation to everybody. Everybody. Therefore, Isaiah seven fourteen, The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. So who's going to believe who will receive, right? That's the question. That's the really question that, that God asks is, are you going to believe and receive? Is that what you're going to do? The promise of a Savior is ours. We just have to receive him. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy and we thank you for the privilege of opening your word and studying these great and mighty promises. We thank you that this promise is a miraculous promise, that it's very precise. We thank you that this promise is a manifested promise, that it's not something that might happen, but it did happen. And we thank you for that, Lord. We give you praise for that, God. We also thank you that it's a meaningful promise, that you're with us. And Lord, I pray that if there's anybody that cannot say that God is with them, that they would turn to Christ and receive him as their personal Lord and Savior. Even those who watch this online, and th those who see this, maybe even for the first time, if they would understand that Jesus came so that they could know him personally. Father, I pray that they would receive him to your glory and honor. 
We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the fulfillment of this promise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thanks, guys, very much. God bless you. Have a great rest of your week. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. And may he give you uh, the ability to see Jesus more each and every day. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.